In June of 1967, Israel was attacked on all fronts by every single one of its Arab neighbors. And if you ask an Israeli today, what was the most pivotal or monumental war in your history? They'll most likely tell you that it was the Six Day War of 1967, because among many other reasons, they retook Jerusalem. The question is, is there a prophecy in the Bible that specifically predicts this war? Yes, there is. And this is a picture of me sitting on a tank. <laughs> so this photo was taken of me several years ago when I visited the Museum of Tanks in Israel. And the reason I'm showing you this tank is because I want you to remember the name of this tank. This is a modern Israeli tank, and they named it the Merkava. Uh, in Hebrew, Merkava. Remember this. If you can remember this, you get extra credit. So today we're going to be talking about Psalm 83 and how this psalm in detail describes the Six-Day War of 1967, how it's an amazing prophecy. Uh, as you know, I'm excited about these prophecies. It's really amazing that we have this, that we're able to know it, to uh, do the digging and to find the treasure. So let's do that. On the right, we have Psalm 83. Here's the prophecy. On the left, I have isolated six elements of this psalm. But remember, these are not all the elements of this psalm, all the prophetic elements. There are many more, but we don't have time in this video to look at every single one. Uh, I have also given each element a little nickname to help us digest this, to help us remember and to understand better what's going on. Okay, let's get right into it. O oh God, do not remain quiet. Do not be silent, and O oh God, do not be still. For behold, your enemies make an uproar, and those who hate you have exalted themselves. They make shrewd plans against your people and conspire together against your treasured ones. They have said, Come, and let us wipe them out as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. This is the first element we are going to consider prophetically, and I nicknamed this one Annihilation. Uh, continuing, verse 5. For they have conspired together with one mind. Against you they make a covenant. This is our second element. Conspiring together and making a covenant. I nicknamed this one Pact. Continuing, verse 6. And here is going to be the, uh, the list of of 11 names. These are the names of the groups, the people who are making the covenant, who are coming to, together to attack Israel, God's precious people, to annihilate them with the specific goal of annihilation. So verse 6, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Geval, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined them. They have become a help to the children of Lot. Eleven names in total. Continuing. Deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera and Yavin at the torrent of Kishon. This is our fourth element. Uh, and I nicknamed this one 300 and 1000. Should be 900 actually here. Continuing. Who were destroyed at Endor, who became as dung for the ground, make their nobles like Orev and Ze'iv, and all their princes like Zeva and Salmunah, who said, Let us possess for ourselves the pastures of God. O oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like chaff before the wind, like fire that burns the forest, and like a flame that sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. This is our fifth element. Destroy them, terrify them. Fill their faces with dishonor that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and dismayed forever and let them be humiliated and perish that they may know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. And our last element, dis dishonor, shame, and humiliation are here. Dishonor, shame, and humiliation. So, you can clearly see these six elements in this prophecy. Let's take them one by one and see how it holds up against history. Number one, come and let us wipe them out as a nation that the name of Israel be remembered no more. This is the goal 
This is what they want. Let's take a look at what the Arabs were saying just a few days before the war. Now remember, uh, the war started June 5th, 1967. And these are quotes just days before that. Uh, this first one is from President Nasser of Egypt, May 25th. He said, The problem presently before the Arab countries is not whether the port of Eilat should be blockaded or how to blockade it, but how totally to exterminate the state of Israel for all time. Then on the 27th, he said, Our basic objective will be the destruction of Israel. The Arab people want to fight. Some uh, radio statements in Cairo at that time on the 19th. This is our chance, Arabs, to deal Israel a mortal blow of annihilation, to blot out its entire presence in our Holy Land. The 22nd, the Arab people are firmly resolved to wipe Israel off the map. 27th, we challenge you, Eshkol, he was the Prime Minister of Israel at the time, to try all your weapons, put them to the test. They will spell Israel's death and annihilation again. Wow. In Iraq, President Abdel on May 31st said, The existence of Israel is an error which must be rectified. This is our opportunity to wipe out the ignominy which has been with us since 1948. Our goal is clear, to wipe Israel off the map. We shall, God willing, meet in Tel Aviv and Haifa. And in Syria, the defense minister on May 20th said, Syria's forces are ready not only to repulse the aggression, but to initiate the act of liberation itself and to explode the Zionist presence in the Arab homeland. The Syrian army, with its finger on the trigger, is united. I, as a military man, believe that the time has come to enter into a battle of annihilation. So this is what the Arabs were saying. Uh, right before the battle. And th th these are just a few quotes. They were ranting these things uh, nonstop, uh, which w was heightening aggression and tension at the time. Okay, let's get back to our elements. So we can see the first element is clear. They said, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. That's their goal. We saw that uh, that's clearly happening in 1967. Next, verse 5, they have, conspired, they have conspired together with one mind. Against you they make a covenant. Verse 5, I want to show you the Hebrew for verse 5. This is Brit Ichrotu. And you may uh, recognize this word Brit from uh, Brit Hadasha, like from the book of Jeremiah, New Covenant or New Testament. This word is the word for cut. So they cut a covenant or they cut a deal. This phrase, I'll probably make a video on this phrase alone in the future. It's just dripping with customs and culture. It has a lot of significance and meaning. So keep an eye out for that video in the future. Uh, yes, okay, they made a pact. On May 30th, the president of Jordan flew to Cairo to sign a mutual defense pact with Egypt. On June 3rd, Iraq also joined the military uh, pact, and all the nations who eventually ended up attacking Israel joined this pact. So they had a covenant to annihilate. Our next element are the names. Okay, let's check out the names. 11 names. On the right, these are all the names in order as they appear in Psalm 83. Let's check out their Hebrew pronunciation because sometimes it can be hard to pronounce them in English. Edom, Ishmaeli, the Ishmaelites, Moab, Hagri, Gval, Amon, Amalek, Fleshet, Sor, Ashur, and Lot. These are the names in order. On the left here, we have their modern counterparts. So Syria and Iraq, Jordanians, these are the modern names for these ancient names. Now let's see if every single one of these people groups, these nations, joined the fight in 1967 against Israel. Let's start with Syria and Iraq. These guys attacked Israel in 1967. That's ancient Assyria. Okay, that's one. Next we have the Jordanians who also attacked Israel. That's Edom, Lot, Moab, and Ammon. Edom, 
Lot, Moab, Ammon. Okay. Next we have Saudi Arabia. They attacked Israel. These guys were ancient Ishmaelites. Ishmaeli. And then we have the Bedouins who attacked Israel. These are ancient Amalekites. And then Egyptians, they attacked Israel. That is the ancient Hagrites. And Gaza Strip, the Philistines, ancient Philistia. And then Lebanon, who attacked Israel. And that's Geval and Tyre. Look at that. Every single group mentioned in Psalm 83, their modern counterparts took part in attacking Israel. Look at this. Every single neighbor of Israel made a pact to push Israel into the sea to annihilate them. That was their goal. Pretty amazing. Let's get back to our elements. So we got the names. Next, verse 9. This one's interesting. Let's get back to our psalm. Verse 9. The psalmist is he's praying out to God and saying, Deal with them as with Midian. What does this mean? Well, if you remember, Gideon, he destroyed the Midianites. Okay, let's check this out. If you remember Gideon, how many men did he have? 300, right? That's our, our nickname here. He had 300 men. And that was something that stood out in this battle, that he was extremely outnumbered. That was uh, just an uh, uh, important part of the story, how he was outnumbered and he only had 300. Let's look at uh, 1967 and see what the Arabs had as for uh, their military might. They, they had 547,000 troops, 900 tanks, 1,000 APCs, 1,000 artillery pieces, and 957 aircraft. They were outnumbered by like five times in 1967. So the psalmist is saying, deal with them as with Midian. Now, in 1967, the deciding factor of the war was how Israel used its air force to decimate the enemy forces. And in one incredibly coordinated uh, airstrike, Israel bombed and destroyed over 10, I think, practically all of the enemy airfield bases and destroyed most of their uh, fighter jets. And so if you can guess uh, how many uh, aircraft Israel had, you get extra credit. That's right, 300. They had 300, just a handful of aircraft, and they decimated uh, the enemy. And when historians look back and they try to analyze how this happened, it just boggles their mind. Uh, they say it defies logic. Uh, people were saying it is a miracle. Uh, that was the, the mood in those days, that after this happened, people were shocked. So Gideon had 300. He was outnumbered. He destroyed the Midianites. Israel had 300 aircraft. They were outnumbered, and they destroyed the enemy uh, military might. Then it continues, as with Sisera and Yavin at the torrent of Kishon. What is this? Okay, well, if you remember, Deborah and Barak, Judges 4, they are attacking Yavin. Here's that guy. And his commander was Sisera, down here in verse 13. Sisera called together all his chariots, 900 iron chariots. And then in chapter 5 is the, the song of Deborah and Barak. It's talking about the tent peg. You remember, it went through the guy's head, went through Sisera's head. And in verse 28, it says, out of the window she looked and lamented, the mother of Sisera, through the lattice. Why does his chariot delay in coming? Why do the hoofbeats of his chariots tarry? So Sisera and his, his 900 iron chariots were destroyed by Barak. And let's check out the Hebrew for his chariots. Mark Votav. This is the Hebrew word. Merkava, which means a chariot. And do you remember 
this word, Merkava, that's right, from the picture I showed you at the beginning of the Israeli tank. They named their tank Merkava because in ancient times, chariots were like the tanks of the battlefield. The more chariots you have, the more power you had. Uh, in today's battlefield, the more tanks you have, the more powerful you have, the more powerful you are. Excuse me. So, back to our psalm. Deal with them as with Midian. Gideon had 300 men. He was outnumbered. Uh, Israel had 300 jets. They were outnumbered. Didn't matter. They still destroyed the Midianites. Sisera had 900 chariots. Uh, a lot of power. It didn't matter. He was still destroyed. And I'm sure you can guess how many, ta how many tanks the Egyptians had. That's right, 900. Now, the Egyptians weren't the only ones who attacked Israel, but they were the main players. Uh, the other Arab nations had a few hundred tanks uh, to add to that, but the Egyptians had 900 tanks, just like how Sisera had 900 iron chariots. Okay, that's number four. Let's continue to number five, destroy them, terrify them. Uh, that's verse 10 and 15. Destroy them. Okay, uh, a German journalist at the time in 1967, he said this, Nothing like this has happened in history. A force including a thousand tanks, hundreds of artillery cannons, many rockets and fighter jets, and a hundred thousand soldiers armed from the head to toe was destroyed in two days in an area covering hundreds of kilometers filled with reinforced outposts and installations. And this victory was carried out by a force that lost many soldiers and much equipment, positions, and vehicles. No military logic or natural cause can explain this monumental occurrence. When this happened, people were shocked. Israel had no hope. They were dead. They were surrounded. They were extremely outnumbered. But the, when they defeated the Arab world, it was, it was a shock. To everyone. It defied logic. Uh, the casualties, over 15,000 Egyptian soldiers were killed, 6,000 Jordanians, 1,000 Syrians, and only 700 Israelis, Israelis were killed in this battle. So they were destroyed. They were decimated. The Israelis completely destroyed them. That's our fifth element. Our sixth element, dishonor, shame, and humiliation from 16 and 17. Dishonor, shame, and humiliation. Dishonor them, shame them, humiliate them. This defeat of the Arabs was the most humiliating defeat. They still look back today and consider it as a huge shame that they lost to this tiny, ill-equipped nation. Uh, what's interesting and why I named uh, or why I named or why nicknamed this uh, element boasting was that the Egyptians, right when the battle started, they were sending out all these fake reports saying that they're destroying the Israelis. Egyptian tanks are rolling over the homes in Tel Aviv, something like that. And they were lying, but they were trying to use this to get the other Arab nations who haven't joined the fight yet to join, and it worked. Uh, when the other Arab nations read this, they thought, okay, it's working, let's do this. And they entered the fight only to find that they themselves were being destroyed. So at the end, all the Arab nations had to, in shame, surrender to Israel. And in shame, they had to give up. And when they look back and see all these these lies, these the boasting that they were doing, it just made it even harder to swallow the defeat for them. So huge shame, huge dishonor for the Arab world that they still haven't gotten over. Uh, so this is the prophecy of Psalm 83 in connection with the Six Day War in 1967. I hope you enjoyed it and learned some cool things from it and are excited about the Word of God as am I. Um, that's it for today. Uh, see you next time.